Vacation Rental Machine helps hosts just like you learn how to start, grow, and scale your short-term rental business. This show is all about creating systems that help you automate your business, giving you more time and money freedom. If you're ready to start living the vacation rental life, then subscribe to this podcast today. Come and join us on our Facebook group, The Host Nation, where we'll be talking about starting, automating, and scaling a short-term rental business. Now, on to the show. Hey, welcome back, Host Nation, to another episode of Vacation Rental Machine. In this episode, we are doing something uh, different again. We've actually got a friend that came to our meetup, the uh, Short-Term Rental Success Secrets Mastermind, and we have someone that is a local who is trying to get into the space using the rental arbitrage method. So uh, we decided to get him on the show to answer or ask some of the common questions that new people that are getting into the space uh, maybe have. Uh, We're going to be talking about things like insurance. We're going to be talking about things things such as uh, what it's you know what to do when you are confronting a new property manager uh, John let's uh, let's introduce Cole and uh, get these questions started absolutely so my name is Cole Allen um, I'm from the Northern Virginia originally born and raised in Fairfax uh, and uh, I've been doing real estate now for about four years working at a public REIT actually and I originally got into the real estate space because I wanted to um, buy properties and, and rent it out long term, but I realized in Arlington, DC area, that was super, super expensive. Um, and I just didn't have the capital. So I kind of put it on the back burner. And then, you know, a couple months ago, I heard about rental arbitrage, um, started listening to the podcast, love the podcast, guys. Um, and so started asking questions, reached out to John, reached out to Julian, um, and really love the opportunity, love the business model. And so that's that's why I'm interested in it. So Cole, what are, what are the you know you you've, you're you're pretty new into the space and you're looking to get started. What are some of the uh, biggest fears that you're having before getting started? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, biggest fears is just one is a lot of information, right? It's you got to find the place, you got to talk to the landlord, got to have the money, you know, design the place, bring everything. It's a lot, and so it's kind of one of the biggest fears I have is chunking it up and putting it into bite-sized pieces. So that, you know, you can kind of just, you know, maybe one day you do this and the next day you do that and you're putting one for one foot in front of the other and actually making sure that you're not getting locked up and then just thinking it's way too big of a project and backing out. So that's probably the biggest fear right now. Right. That, and that's that's one of the things that I always harp uh, on both uh, on both of the podcasts is that there there is there is a, a lot of information out there. You know, you're, you're getting into the space where it's hospitality with real estate, with search engine optimization, with, you know, interior design and yep. like all, all this stuff. So it's like, man, a person that's just getting into this, it can feel overwhelming. But um, you're you're looking to really kind of pound the pavement, get started. And you have some uh, specific questions in regards to rental arbitrage so uh, uh where, where, where would you say john you, you've talked to cole before where would you say he is on the vacation rental machine uh steps um he's right where he needs to be um technically he he's taken a look at things he's kind of identified uh himself as being a, a good host in general so the hospitality side is done uh we've he's also identified the strategy that he's trying to use he's going to start in his own backyard before he jumps to something overseas He's right where he needs to be. He's ready to go out, pound the pavement, get some yeses, and then fly by the seat of his pants. Right. So, so Cole, Cole's really kind of in that sweet spot. We, I, I'd say he's probably within that around that uh, step two where we're doing the market research and we're ready to start going out there. So, Cole, what are some of the uh, common or what are some of the questions that you have in regards to uh, starting this business? Yeah. So, I guess my, my questions today are really centered around kind of that initial conversation with the landlord. Uh, so, I mean, just jumping right into it, I guess, first off is, do you tell the landlord immediately when you walk in, this is what I'm doing? Do you wait to tour? You know, at what point do you introduce the, the idea of, Hey, this is what I want to do. All right. So, um, what I've always done and what I believe is best is to not jump into it right away. Before doing any of that, you want to make sure that this apartment is, the best fit for you and it works for your business model and it works for how you envision your guest interacting. Next question I have is, is kind of what materials should I bring uh, to kind of show my legitimacy, show my dedication to the effort? Is there like a pitch deck that I bring? Do I bring an example of a rental agreement? Uh, What, what do you bring to a, a conversation? When I started out, I didn't bring anything. 
I mean, I, I really entered the entire thing just as if I was interested in the apartment. I just happened to be representing this company that is trying to acquire multiple units in the area. And um, my pitch was somewhat like, hey, we do corporate housing. Um, but at the same time, we also list our properties on some marketing sites like Booking.com, like Expedia, and sometimes Airbnb. Would you say that bringing something would help in the, in the situation? Or is it kind of, do you think, okay to kind of go without? Well, I look at it like this. If I bring a lot of stuff with me and I give it to you, that doesn't leave the door open for me to revisit. That's fair. So in case you had some objections or something that kind of went on, um, maybe I'll say, you know what, I I'll come back with those answers and I'll give you the card or I'll, I'll bring something for you. You kind of leave the door open for you to come back again if you don't give them so much information up front. Um, the other objection to just bringing a bunch of information is you probably will start giving away some of your secrets if you give them too much. That's fair. No, that's definitely fair. Because then in theory, you know, some of them could do it themselves. Right. No, that's definitely fair. Um, I guess what are kind of some of the big counterpoints that, um, you know, a landlord will hit you with? Like, yeah, no, it sounds great, but because of this, I won't do it. I won't allow it. Uh, the biggest one, obviously, man, Airbnb, you said Airbnb, man, they party, they keep noise. My people won't like it. No, it's just not going to work. No, uh, no way. That's what you're going to hear. You're going to hear that. You're going to hear, you know, just about wear and tear on the property. You're going to hear um, complaints uh, about you being able to pay the rent sometimes. Um, or you might hear just, uh, this is probably a fair complaint that the neighbors just won't like rotating people coming in and out. Um, and if the community is a little bit older, I, I somewhat believe that, right? If, if my parents are there and, you know, they're up in age, I would prefer that they had steady neighbors beside them. That way they could build some type of bond or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, that still won't stop me. Um, but it, it, is a, it is something that people will bring up. I guess, how do you get around some of those things like noise, um, you know, wear and tear, not paying the rent? I guess, how do you get around those questions? Well, I'm a professional company. I mean, I do this, you know, day in and day out. And I have systems and standards in place that basically just uh, defend against all of that. I have noise monitors in each apartment. I know before you know that there's noise. I'm able to jump on those things. Um, before they become an issue to any one of the neighbors. Uh, if there really is a major enough issue, I will have somebody there on the ground to remediate it quickly. And I'll send you a report about it, just letting you know, hey, this is what happened and this is how it was resolved. Um, it is to our utmost, uh, you know, professionalism that we make sure that everybody surrounding the apartment is safe. They're not disturbed. And, you know, we're putting in our best people. I mean, I'll describe sometimes the people that I'm attracting. Hey, I'm bringing in military families. I'm bringing in, you know, business travelers. Um, highlight the people that you're really targeting uh, just so they have a picture of not somebody bringing in 26 packs and smoking and all that other stuff, the stuff that they really have in mind when they think of Airbnb. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And then actually on the noise sensors, I know noise sensors are, are uh, something we've talked about before and people definitely want to know about it. Are there specific brands that you look at or do you have one brand? Yeah, I, I am exclusively using um, NoiseAware. NoiseAware. Okay. NoiseAware.io.com. And they're, they're not a uh, sponsor yet of this podcast. So maybe eventually, but <laughs> not right now. Sounds good. Uh, and then you mentioned um, the uh, that you're a professional business. So when I'm looking at this lease and I'm signing it, is my business signing it, and, or am I signing it personally? How does that, especially for someone like me who's gonna, you know, doesn't have any yet, and will be signing the first one? Yes. Um, one of the first steps in trying to wean things your way is to sign it as a business. The reason why you want to sign it as a business is because. If you sign it personally, you are now the tenant that they expect. 
if you sign it as a business, there is no specific person that can be assigned to the apartment. It automatically somewhat loosens the lease contract because now you're allowed to sublet. Now we kind of just need to kind of wean it to where we're able to online market it to whoever we want to or uh, any one of the booking channels. Gotcha. Gotcha. Do you, for a first timer, did you have to, even if you did sign it for your business, do you still have to personally guarantee it? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's sometimes in there. Um, if it's a big REIT, uh, they're probably going to want you to, to do your company name slash your name. Uh, sometimes you can't avoid it. Um, I've done it. I didn't have any, any bad experience with it. Uh, now at this point with the, the volume that I have and the recommendations I have, I don't need to. Um, I've also had REITs try to pull business credit, stuff like that. Um, so once you get your entity stood up, I would suggest that you go to uh, Dunn and Bradstreet and create a Dunn's number. That way, um, a DMB number, you can Google that and um, you just have something there. It won't pull anything, but there will be something there that they can then pull and then ask you more questions about the company. What is the Duns and Bradstreet? I've never heard of that. DMB is business credit. So where, you know, Experian, Equifax, and uh, TransUnion are personal credit, uh, DMB is business credit. Gotcha. In some uh, cases, they, they only just want the number. They want to know that you have a number. Okay, gotcha. Uh, and then I guess let's let's get into the lease. Um, you know, what is the difference um, between a normal lease if I'm going to live there for 12 months versus what we're kind of doing? What are the differences um, between it? What amendments do we need? Kind of what language needs to be in there? Gotcha. So, um, again, you're probably going to sign their lease. If it's a bigger building, the bigger the building, the less likely you are to bring in a piece of paper that's your lease that has the right exclusions that you would want. So what you need to create is an amendment to their lease that basically says that your company can operate within the building. Uh, you're probably gonna highlight some paragraphs that they have noted um, that you strictly wanna strike. So for instance, that might be, you know, that you cannot sublet or something like that. You wanna exclusively like highlight those and just kind of X them out with whatever uh, is in your amendment. More importantly, you want to make sure that you have in there that you're going to online market um, the listing itself. And I don't typically lead with Airbnb first, um, but I do say, hey, my personal website and other booking channels similar to booking.com, Expedia, Airbnb, HomeAway, I do put a et cetera. Sometimes I don't go that in depth um, just because I don't want to scare anybody. If we're at this point to where we're looking at this document, we are about to sign this document. So it's only one page. Um, I'll share it with you and Julian to introduce it to everybody else and where they can grab it later on. And um, yeah, it's just enough. It's not intimidating. Um, it has been looked over by somebody um, on the legal side of things, again, uh, if you're going to use it, I would have somebody take a look at it on your behalf just to make sure that um, it qualifies for everything that you need. Uh, and um, again, I'm not a lawyer or anything like that. So, um, yeah, there's that disclaimer. Yeah, sounds, sounds good. Sounds good. I guess something that may be in the lease rules maybe um, just is a legal um, consideration is maximum number of occupants. So, you know, if there's, if I'm leasing a one bedroom, they're probably thinking there's two people going to be in there, but maybe I want to have four cause I have a air mattress I'm going to put out, you know, what is kind of the maximum? Is that a negotiation point? How does that work? Um, I would shy away. The bigger the building is from, from going against their max number. Um, again, you could probably always add two, but it shouldn't be a permanent thing. And I think that's normally what they're calling out when they do the lease is the permanent occupancy of um, people shouldn't be this number, but nobody's gonna say, hey, if I had family come over and they slept on the couch that now I'm instead of two, I have four. Yep. 
That makes sense. Uh, and then I guess talking with the landlord on the maintenance of the property, you know, it's an interesting position because they own the land, but you're kind of operating it all. Obviously you're going to have your cleaning crews come in after each guest, but if a light bulb is out, are you fixing it? And then if there's a major problem, you know, water main breaks, are you fixing that as well? All right. So that is somewhat murky waters. So one thing that you'll get with the big building is you'll get a guarantee on maintenance and response times and just an overall way or uh, process to resolve issues. With the smaller buildings, you might actually not have that in the, anywhere in the agreement, um, but it is 100% their responsibility. What's going to happen is you might have a guest coming in the next day, the next hour. How do you resolve those issues quickly? Sometimes you have to do them. For instance, if there's a plumbing issue, uh, if it's small, you might have to just go ahead and do it and bill the landlord later or just eat the cost and just know that you you satisfied the whole thing before the next guest and you didn't lose the reservation. Yeah. So it's somewhat a good balance. That dance is, is normally situational. Um, huh. But the majority of the fixes and why I love rental arbitrage is it's on somebody else. But when it really gets in the way of my guest, uh, I'm going to probably resolve it myself. No, it makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, and then if they ask kind of, this is, might be a, a question that would have been for earlier, but when you're like, they may ask, how are you going to manage guests? I guess, how do you get them comfortable with how you're managing the ins and the outs and the, the, the turning of, you know, the apartment? So uh, it's always good to mention that you're represent, representing a company and that you have a team. That way they know that one, you're legit. You're not just, just this solo guy, which you are at this point. Yeah. Um, that's going to be, you know, doing all these things. Uh, but you want to mention somewhat of a team. You want to let them know that after each guest is uh, left, that there's an inspection that happens uh, before guests checked in. After it's clean, there's an inspection that happens. And um, that in between those cleanings, you will maintain the property and keep it the way that it looks pretty much at this state, whatever state it is when you acquire it. Um, because your cleaning practices are going to be conducive to that, right? It's going to get cleaned probably four times a week. Yeah, um, which is more than there, anyone else, a long-term tenant is going to. Right. Um, one one objection that you'll get is somewhat like that. And the way to overcome it is, hey, I mean, you can look at my reviews. You can look at the reviews on this listing. You can see what I'm doing. You can see that, you know, I got a five-star clean rating. You can see that people are really enjoying their stay. You can see more of what's going on in my apartment externally, which you don't have from any one of your other tenants. Yep. No, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. And I guess get into a little bit of its own subject, but definitely still pertinent is the case of insurance. And when talking with the landlord about insurance, that's something that they're probably going to ask, what do we need to have? What do you have? Kind of what is your approach towards insurance for for your properties? Gotcha. So uh, Airbnb, they offer a million dollar uh, host guarantee. Um, it is not what you rely on. It's good. Uh, it's a good layer. You should really have adequate insurance on top of that. And what I mean by adequate insurance is something that is somewhat more traditional, um, like with the regular landlord tenant kind of scenario, because even though you're subletting, you are kind of like a pseudo landlord. So I want the guarantee of loss of income. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so that way, let's just say water main breaks and the apartment is gone and you know, landlord is going to fix it, but it's going to take three to four months. Well, I would still like to get paid for the time that I'm, I'm losing. And you can have insurance that does that. Um, and I would, I'll send you who I recommend. They're not a sponsor of this podcast, but, yet. <laughs> but they will be. <laughs> Perfect. That's, I really appreciate that. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Um, there's also some smaller companies that you can get. I, I don't necessarily recommend them. I, Julian mentioned some, 
Uh, one is called Lemonade. Uh, and I think there was another one that's out there. Um, they don't have that, that one piece that I talked about. So they're not really an all-inclusive um, solution for me. Yeah. Do you need to, so do you start communications with these insurance people before you have a property or once you have a property and before you go live? When does that start? Uh, pretty much once I sign the lease. Okay. Um, once I sign the lease, that really starts the running. I mean, once you sign the lease, you're going to be sending out, um, you know, emails about insurance. You're going to start calling about utilities. You're going to start switching over stuff like that. You're going to start thinking about design. If you don't already have a designer or however you're going to do those things, that really starts the race. Yeah. So I don't want to kind of preemptively get people included into things until I really need them because yeah. I don't want them to be like, this guy is just blowing smoke, you know? Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Um, and then I guess on the insurance, is that insurance that you have, does that cover like liability as well? So if somebody gets hurt, it's a call all encompassing Yep. and it's held at the property, not at your overall company corporate right it's held at the property so each each property will have its own insurance policy um or they're able to aggregate uh policies within the same building under one umbrella awesome. so instead of having maybe a two million dollar limit it probably will be somewhere around five if you have multiples under, under it. perfect perfect um, yeah, and that's that's those are the questions that I had. All right, really appreciate it. That was really helpful. And that's really what we are looking for uh, in the Host Nation community. We're looking for people that are engaged on this process of their vacation rental machine, so that we can help you work out these steps uh, to get the ball rolling. Uh, like Cole says, he he's trying to he's pounding pavement. He's going out there and he's asking these tough questions that are things that you have to think about before you just start going out there. So uh, thank you so much, Cole, for 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 coming onto the show for uh, asking these questions that are really important and. Um, yeah, until, until next time, Host Nation, keep on hosting. Hope you host found value in this episode. If you did, please go on over to iTunes and leave us a review as that would greatly support the show. If you'd like to connect with John, the community, and I, then go on over to our Facebook group, The Host Nation. Talk to you hosts in the next episode. Keep on hosting.